we now proceed with our first panel discussion focusing on the regulatory reforms a post-budget analysis. Uh, we are about to be joined by the eminent speakers. So firstly, I'd like to welcome our speakers of the first panel discussion. Can we have a round of applause for Ms. Subalakshmi Ponce, former CMD, Allahabad Bank. May I please invite uh, Mrs. Subalakshmi Ponce to please come on the dais to take her seat. She's a non-executive director on board of Federal Bank, the non-executive director on board of ILNFS Financial Services Limited, and also chairman of the Quality Review Board of Indian Institute of Actuaries. And she's come with 38 years of experience in the field of banking. Our next speaker for the session is the managing director and CEO of NSDL. Can we have a round of applause for Mr. G.V. Nageshwar Rao? Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. G.V. Nageshwar Rao has over 26 years of experience in various sectors of financial services, including life insurance, retail banking, corporate banking, as well as capital markets. Moving on, our next speaker for the session, can we have a round of applause for the chairman of LIC India, Mr. S.K. Roy. Mr. S.K. Roy took charge as the chairman, Life Insurance Corporation of India in the year 2013 and he comes with more than 30 years of experience in the LIC of India. Our next speaker for the session, could we have a round of applause for Mr. R. Amalor Pavanathan, who is the DMD of Nabad. And in fact, uh, as a Deputy Managing Director of NABAD, he has uh, been with NABAD since 1984, and he also has varied experience in the areas of project finance, banking, institutional development, training, as well as financial management. Moving on, uh, our next speaker for the session, could we have a round of applause for Mrs. Ratna Vishwanathan, Deputy CEO and CC of MFIN. Mrs. Ratna spearheads self-regulation and communications activity and she brings to MFIN a combination of government and development sector experience belonging to the 1987 batch of prestigious Indian Adult and Account Service. She comes with extensive uh, audit as well as finance experience across a range of departments for the Government of India. Now spearheading our first panel discussion, I'd like to invite on stage our panel chair, the partner and national leader with financial services ENY India, Mr. Abhizer Devanji. Can we have a huge round of applause, please? Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Abhizer Devanji comes with extensive experience of over 15 years and his focus industries include banking and financial services. And he's also part of the transaction advisory services at EY in India, specializing in financial services. With that, I'd like to hand over the proceedings of our first panel discussion to Mr. Devanji. Over to you, sir. Uh, right. uh, welcome everyone uh, to this ET Edge Financial <coughs> Inclusion uh, Summit. Uh, we have, frankly, a very distinguished, and if I may say so, varied panel here. We have people from insurance, we have people from microfinance, we have people from banking, we have got people from the agricultural side of things, which is Nabad, and we also have people from the Life Insurance Corporation. So, frankly, we have a very wide range of discussion around here. Uh, and what we want to really focus on uh, in this session, I'll just kick it off and the format is that I'll kind of kick it off for 5 or 10 minutes. Uh, I uh, expect each of the speakers to speak for 5 or 10 minutes again about their perspective on the regulatory reform and on financial inclusion, on their respective areas of expertise. Uh, then we move on to the question answer hour and as part of that, frankly, we leave it open to the audience to then ask questions. So clearly, this is the format we'd like to follow. Just to talk about financial inclusion, frankly, it's been spoken about many times, debated many times. Uh, there are evolving regulations coming in day, uh, day after day. The government is coming out with various schemes trying to make sure uh, that uh, the financially excluded are part of the system. So, frankly, if one looks at the Wikipedia definition of financial inclusion, it really says affordable financial services which are accessible. So just look at these two things for us. What is affordable for a consumer? What has been the biggest problem with financial inclusion thus far is that the services are not necessarily affordable. Whether it is credit, or whether it is the cost of credit, or whether it is the cost of collection of deposits, or whether it is the convenience in terms of banking. None of which have really been affordable over a period of time. The other issue that we look at is access. You know, it's, it's a, it's a, I was discussing it with somebody the other day, that a villager would walk four kilometers to fetch water. 
but he would not walk more than half a kilometer to access a financial services network. So clearly the financial services network has to be much more deeper to his reach, to his access, for him to be able to get uh, the, the benefit of that financial services. So clearly inclusion uh, will require affordability, will require access. Now, the dilemma is that when you provide affordability and when you provide access, what you tend to miss out on is, is it a sustainable business? So frankly, what we want to debate today is, as financial services, financial inclusion, is financial inclusion something which is going to be profitable enough for it to remain sustainable? And that is a very important aspect uh, for everybody. It cannot be just a CSR activity, just a, an obligation. It is clearly an obligation because there are other avenues to deploy capital where people would want to deploy capital. And people should be directed towards deploying capital uh, uh, to a profitable means. It may be less profitable than others, but it certainly has to be profitable. It should at least recover cost of capital for somebody to say that I would like to enter into that field on a sustained basis. So we want to uh, explore the whole sustainability. Frankly, just talking about reform, in terms of reform, what the government has done, if I were to akin it to 2000, uh, when there was a bit of a revolution in the telecom industry, what we saw is we were all paying 16 rupees per minute, etc., on our Ericsson telephone. Suddenly there was a bit of a, a revolution and there was one player who came and said, let me make sure that every individual has a handset in his hand. And when that happened, the cost of telecom services drastically reduced because the number of consumer increased, the volume increased. And telecom frankly is one story in India where we see that it became affordable and because it became affordable, we have 900 million telecom users today. More than the amount of, much, much more than the amount of bank holders today. Only 34% of the Indians hold banks today. But I'm sure many, many more hold mobile phones today. And the reason why that is, is that volume and a breakthrough in technology made telecom affordable. If I were to put that analogy into financial services, frankly, Jandhan has done that. 12 crore accounts. Approximately 7 crore in urban inclusion, 5 crores in rural inclusion. We have 12 crores accounts being set up. It is akin to handing out those cheaper handphones. What we would expect the panel to discuss today is, how do you top up those handphones today? Because unless you top it up, unless there is usage, those 12 crores mean nothing. Before this 12 crores also, we had 6 crore accounts, frankly, in our system, which were no-frills accounts. And those no-frills accounts were not being used. But now is the opportunity to say that infrastructure has been created and from whatever we see of the policy that has been coming on, whether it is payments bank, whether it is small banks, whether it is MFI licensing, whether it is Mudra Bank, whether it is obligations put on to existing financial services institutions to actually build and get more rural, all of this tells us that the strategy is much beyond opening bank accounts. So the strategy in telecom terms is much beyond handing out handphones. It now goes into the next phase to say, how do we top up those phones? And once you top up those phones, there will be revenue. Once there will be revenue, there will be profitability. And once there will be profitability, there will be sustainability. Clearly, what this panel wants to discuss today is how do we reach that level of sustainability with the kind of uh, regulations that are coming out, the kind of regulations that have come on in the past, what will come on going forward. So frankly, we see uh, that, to be, uh, uh, that to be quite an important thing. So with that, frankly, uh, my job is less to talk and more to ask. Uh, so I would like to hand over to each of the panelists and maybe we can, uh, we can start with Mr. Roy and then move on uh, down the line. Uh, each person giving their perspective uh, of how they see financial inclusion in the current regulatory regime uh, moving ahead with their respective fields and then we can move forward. Mr. Roy. Thank you very Morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Divanji, my fellow panelists. Uh, I will be uh, speaking for about uh, seven, eight minutes, uh, primarily focusing on the insurance part of uh, financial inclusion. Uh, Mr. Divanji, in his opening remarks, has uh, laid out the, uh, the broad contours of what the present system is 
and where do we want to reach. I will narrow down the focus a little and specifically deal with issues which pertain to the realm of insurance. Before I do that, I would like to pose one question and then try to suggest certain alternatives which would broadly reply to that question. The first question that I would like to pose is that uh, what do we need to do to achieve the goals that the country has set out for itself by way of financial inclusion? And my hypothesis is that amongst the many things that the country would need to do to achieve the goals set out for achieving financial inclusion, uh, we could focus on three of them uh, for the sake of this discussion. And uh, the first one is what I call demand. Demand means in this context that if the government has seen a vision that every unbanked individual in this country must have a bank account, then this vision has to be seen by the 30-odd crore BPL families and a large segment of them who would be unbanked today to share that vision of the government. And when they share the vision of the government, then that would generate the demand for getting included in this financial inclusion package. So the first uh, issue, the first thing that we need to do is possibly in this, uh, my suggestion, my, my hypothesis, is to create that demand in the minds of the end beneficiary. The second issue that we will have to address to achieve the outcomes of financial inclusion is another D and this D stands for distribution. As Mr. Diwanji was just now mentioning that there have been past attempts at creating platforms for financial inclusion. They have achieved or they had achieved certain levels of success. My view is that if the goals of financial inclusion are to be achieved, the second key factor that we need to get right is that what is the distribution strategy which will be used by various entities. It could be a life insurance company, it could be a non-life insurance company, it could be a health insurance company, it could be a bank, it could be an MFI, it could be anybody. Anybody who is part of the project, we would need to get the question of the distribution system in place because that is one of the keys to, this, to success. The third D that we need to get right and possibly, uh, though there would be no hierarchy, but possibly a very, very important issue to get right is delivery. By delivery, I mean that there is a scheme. How do we convert that scheme into a service which is expected to be delivered to the end beneficiary? Unless the gap between the scheme and the service is narrowed down, it would be very, very difficult to sustain the project of financial inclusion. We would have big bang starts. There would be spurts of activity at periodic intervals whenever reviews will happen. But to keep them ongoing on a, in a sustained manner, it would be very, very necessary that we get the delivery system in place. Now, the, I have, I said that I will first raise three questions, uh, uh, I mean, uh, I will raise the question that what needs to be done to achieve the outcomes of the financial inclusion project. The other end of the spectrum which I would just like to touch upon at this moment is that how do we address or what are the other critical issues that we need to address? An important point raised by Mr. Divanji about pricing. 
All of us who are in the business of delivering product and services to beneficiaries are aware of the fact that pricing is a key component which would determine whether a project will succeed or not. Pricing is critical not only from the point of view of the end beneficiary, it is important because pricing will depend what will be the remuneration for the distributor. The pricing will, de will decide what will be, if any, savings that the service provider could make. And I'm sure all of you are aware that Honorable Finance Minister in his budget speech has launched three uh, social security schemes in the budget. One of them is called the Jeevan Jyoti scheme. There, the Life Insurance Corporation of India and others, ins other insurance companies also can provide a cover of 2 lakhs of rupees at a rate of less than 1 rupee per day. Now, this is very critical because if the product is priced which is beyond the reach of, a, of the intended beneficiary over a sustained period of time, then the product will not succeed. So, the pricing is a very, very critical component, uh, issue which we have to keep in mind. The second important issue that we have to keep in mind is the role that technology will play in achieving the goals of financial inclusion. We in the LIC believe that technology supplements human endeavor, it does not substitute it. This may be true for our general line of business, but when we come to a critical area of operations like social security or financial inclusion, it appears that to make this project ongoing over a period of time, technology will have to play a very, very critical role. The last point that I want to raise uh, as a critical issue in achieving the goals of financial inclusion, uh, this question was prompted by the panel chair, Mr. Diwanji, that what is the role of the data that we hold which we can serve the ends of financial inclusion. Uh, we are very proud of the fact that the LIC of India is privileged to serve approximately 300 uh, citizens on a one-to-one -one basis. So we hold possibly one of the largest databases in this country. Now, how do we leverage this database to enable that the fruits of financial inclusion reach the intended beneficiary? It's a very major challenge. Uh, but I think in the, in the long run, going ahead, we will need to also keep that in mind that how this large database of large institutions like LIC, there are other institutions also which have large databases, how we can leverage this database to achieve the goals of financial inclusion. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, these are a few uh, opening remarks I thought uh, I should share with you. Uh, if there will be any questions after the end of uh, the uh, panelists speaking, I will be happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Abhizir, and uh, good morning, friends. Uh, to my mind, one of the uh, most uh, significant regulatory reforms that are on the anvil is the introduction of payment banks. You know, so I wish to speak uh, for a few minutes about that. Uh, all of us would agree that payments lie at the heart of the financial system. You know, so every exchange of goods or services, every investment, every credit transaction, every income expenditure, every transaction, in fact, is accompanied by a payment. So the cost speed and efficiency with which you can actually make payments, you can say will determine the efficiency of the real economy. And that's how important the payment system is. You know, our banking system has done a commendable job in meeting the needs of a vast population and delivering banking services with fair efficiency. Uh, but our payment system continue, you know, is yet not modernized. Uh, centuries old traditional methods 
like cash and checks uh, dominate our payments. You know, none of us can really step out without carrying sufficient cash in our wallets. We all make payments to someone in cash. Both of us have bank accounts. We have the bank account and the recipient has the bank account, yet we make payments to that person in cash. And that's because today the bank account is not serving as a vehicle for direct transfer of value between the two accounts. And that function is actually getting intermediated by cash. And we are such a cash dominated economy primarily because of lack of alternatives, lack of effective alternatives to cash. You know, we go to an ATM or a branch, withdraw cash, we spend typically in our neighborhood, you know, or maybe in the city. And the recipient in turn actually takes the same cash and goes and bank, goes and deposits back into the bank. You know, as bankers, we have seen as to what this involves. We actually maintain a huge infrastructure in the form of ATMs, in the form of branch infrastructure to actually dispense this cash continuously. And it's an unending cycle. You know, and this cash is actually deposited back into the same bank, you know, by the recipients. And what does that really involve, you know, it involves actually a huge cost, you know, that cost which is actually not perceived. All of us operate a huge physical infrastructure in order to handle cash and there are cash vans running all over the place because of that, uh, you know, so to transferring cash from one place to the other. The cash that we all carry doesn't earn any, any interest income for us, nor does it become productive capital for the economy. There is a huge cost involved in storing, transporting, counting, reconciling cash. And in fact, uh, the, it's a very similar story uh, with respect to checks as well. Checks are the mainstay of all business payments. Although both parties have bank accounts, in this case, bank accounts is absolutely mandatory in order to have a check transaction. But again, you don't make payments directly. You draw a check on your bank, first you get a checkbook and draw a check, physically reach it to the payee and who in turn actually has to deposit back with his bank. It goes through a clearing process of course so that you know in order to actually transfer value from one account to the other. All of this can be far more efficient. You know, so this is still a system that probably belongs to one or two centuries ago. I think uh, the introduction of payment banks is a step that can potentially change the way all of us make payments. And I think I would see this as an extremely transformatory, transformative kind of a step uh, that can make a significant change to the payment landscape in the coming years and decades. You know, when I spoke about cash, of course, uh, and I said that of course, uh, all of us, uh, none of us can really function without cash, I would think that it is also one of the most important reasons why people are excluded from the banking system. You know, because if you were to look at underbanked, underserved, low income segments, and their transactions are mostly in cash, they receive their income in cash, they typically tend to spend in cash, the amount of surplus that they carry is too small. You know, so typically they can either carry it on their person or, or leave it with somebody known to them. Therefore, even if they have a bank account, they don't really find a use for it. You know, so it's not just about having a bank account, but it is about actually needing to use it. And that's also one of the reasons as to why, because so we have been discussing as to how, while Jandhan Yojana has been a sterling success in terms of ensuring that every household has a bank account, it's also true that those accounts are not used for actual payment or banking transactions. So what do we need to do? And I think uh, the vision has been articulated by the finance minister uh, in the budget. Okay, so in fact, uh, now there is uh, this uh, uh, you know, so interesting uh, new term, JAM, JAM Trinity, which was actually uh, you know, so, uh, proposed in the economic survey okay, so, and the finance minister endorsed it. Jandhan Yojana, which I think is basically to say that everyone has access to a bank account. 
and second is A for Aadhaar. You know, the fact that Aadhaar today has taken root so successfully means that Aadhaar based authentication has become possible. In fact, we are ourselves in NSDL, so we are a registrar for Aadhaar. We today issue about 1 lakh new Aadhaar enrollments every day. That is the speed at which you know, Aadhaar is taking root. And we have already crossed more than 5 crores uh, in terms of Aadhaar enrollments. And we also do Aadhaar based authentications. You know, so we have so far done 40 million such authentications, okay, so which, which shows that this entire ecosystem is well established and has taken root. Much of this traffic today really comes from business correspondents wanting to authenticate using Aadhaar, but you can see that it works. So therefore, there is an Aadhaar based authentication, okay, so which can actually make payments simple. And, and the most importantly, the mobile revolution that has swept India. You know, so today, India has 930 million mobile subscribers. That's about 74% of the population. You know, even in rural areas, the mobile penetration is 45%. And Tri publishes these numbers because so that at an individual subscriber level, because so that you know, so. And you know that if you were to look at household penetration, which is after the number is not actually published by Tri. But if you were to look at uh, household penetration, you can be sure that the coverage is near complete. You know, because even if you were to assume there, are, there is a rural penetration of 45% by individual subscribers, and even if you were to assume, you know, so two, three, or four people in a family, uh, you know, so the coverage of mobile is today extremely high. And if you were to actually look at the geographic breakup of the mobile penetration, you will see that there are a few states which are actually pulling down this national average. And in most other states, the penetration is extremely high. So therefore, it's now become a viable medium to deliver services and it has become a viable medium to deliver payment services. And I think this is where, okay, so I expect to see the payments bank, payments bank play an extremely important role. And it's the innovators who need to lead the way. You know, even if you see globally, uh, mobile-based payments is big. Companies like Apple and Google are investing in technologies to make mobile-based payments. And the new payment banks which are on the anvil can actually revolutionize the way that all of us can use mobile devices to make payments. I was referred to cost and access. You know, one way to provide access is, uh, you know, so to set up infrastructure, because whether it is branches, business correspondence, or whatever you like. The other way is to take the bank to the client, not letting the customer come to the bank, but take the bank to the customer. Because in fact, C. Rangarajan Committee on Financial Inclusion use the exact words. And today, technology makes it possible. So technology can provide access and do it at low cost. You know, for example, in NSDL, so we do securities transactions, which are also in a way similar to payments because it involves transfer of value from one account to the other in the form of securities. Today, we process about 250 million transactions in a year, and we provide that service at the cheapest cost known for any depository in the world. So, the Indian technological capabilities and the kind of expertise that's available in our country is well known. You know, you can do the same thing with payments as well. And even more interesting is, because of that, the changing nature of financial inclusion. Because of what is financial inclusion? You know, so Dr. Agaram Rajan's committee in 2008 said that uh, we often tend to focus on credit as the, uh, you know, so as fronting the financial inclusion. But actually what's more important is to get uh, people to use payments and simple savings, investment, insurance, pension products. I mean, that is financial inclusion. You know, so, and, you know, so going, uh, you know, so thinking about credit as part of the financial inclusion is like putting cart before the horse. That's what, you know, the committee said. And if you were to actually look at uh, providing simple savings, investment, insurance, and pension products uh, to all segments of society, there is one more important element that actually fits in with the payment bank, and that is the introduction of 
single operating DMAT account, which the finance minister announced in the last budget. You know, and what that vision envisages is that every single financial product, be it deposits, be it insurance policies, be it capital market products, shares, equities, anything, any financial asset should be capable of being held electronically in paperless form. And today we already allow operating that account using mobile devices. So it's a simple step to integrate payments and the ability to hold all financial assets in one single account, which allows every citizen of this country to be able to access payments, savings, investment, insurance, and pension products in a very convenient way at very affordable cost using mobile as an important device. And of course, it's available, it will be available through all other channels as well. I think, I think this is the kind of revolution that I would expect to see uh, sweeping our country in the coming years and decades. And I think it can make a significant change and actually be a showcase to the rest of the world. Uh, you know, so with a population of our size, of course, and a country of our size, of course, so making it possible. And that's what we look forward to making happen. So that's, thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Diwanji and my fellow panelist members. Uh, well, when I'm looking at the Prime Minister's Janadhana Yojana, which has initiated the whole process of financial inclusion, uh, there's a lot of discussion that as of 15th of Jan 2015, we have opened somewhere around 11.5 crore of accounts and uh, there was also a news item that 70% of them are having a zero balance account and then there has been a lot of discussion that what do we do with all these accounts. As a banker I feel there are two requirements which are absolutely essential. One is funding. So a lot of funds need to be coming into these accounts and that is what we are trying the government is trying through the DBT process. So various subsidies, various scholarships will be getting rooted through these accounts. And second is the number of transactions that happen. Now when we are doing this, there is a third point which is absolutely essential is this whole new players or the new customers who are coming into the fold of banking, we need to train them because their knowledge of basic banking is very, very minimal. And that's why it's absolutely essential to train them. Why save? Why save in a bank? Why borrow from a bank? Why make timely payments? And what do we do to generate employment? Now this is presently being done through a whole lot of infrastructure which has already been created in the earlier avatara of financial inclusion all the commercial banks have set up something called as financial literacy and credit counseling centers. Each bank has been given responsibility of the state where it is an SLBC convener and these financial literacy counseling centers have been set up where we are giving training to all these new customers who are coming to the fold where we are teaching them what is basic banking what is a saving account? What is a fixed deposit account? What is an overdraft account? And why it is absolutely essential to service the interest so that the account doesn't become NPA because NPA, this is a new terminology for these customers. And if we have to fund them and we have to ensure that they use these funds for generating more entrepreneurship, it is essential for them to understand. And that's why these financial literacy credit counseling centers are must. And when we are setting up the small banks and the payment banks, probably at the back end, they need to take part in this FLCC initiative. The third absolutely essential point is that all these who are below the poverty line, if we have to train them, we have also to ensure that upgradation of skill happens. For this, again, there is a huge infrastructure which is available and 
Of the 622 districts which are there in India, in 583 districts, we have already set up institutes which are called as RCTs, that is Rural Self-Employment Training Institutes. Now, in these institutes where the central government, the state government, the Ministry of Rural Development banks that are involved, these institutes have been set up which are manned by the banking professionals and all those who are in the surrounding areas below the poverty line who would like to get training, they come there, lodging, boarding and training, all the costs have been taken care of by the banks and the training, various trainings which are absolutely essential in that area, ranging from two days to one month, these trainings do take place. These all these young entrepreneurs, would-be entrepreneurs come over there, they undergo the training and in the, on the last day they are taught how to prepare a project report. We don't stop over there, what is done is after preparation of the project report, some of the surrounding branch managers get involved and handholding is done and an entrepreneur gets born. And for next two years, a support is given to him till he establishes or she establishes her business. Some of the most important development that have taken place in these rural areas is you have all of, us see, all of a sudden seen a plethora of beauty parlors. Because most of the ladies or the girls who have come and got the training, they have set up these beauty parlors or even photography or video call. Now, all these trainings, we have seen the new entrepreneurs who have developed and those who have not really started there, they are trained and they join those who have generated employment in these areas. So, when we are talking of how to make these 70% of the accounts really profitable for themselves and for the banks also, we need to ensure that we give them basic training we also need to ensure that we give them skill upgradation training and it can be done through the infrastructure which is already there. The logical question is, if so much is being done, then why are we really setting up small banks and why are we going in for payment banks? With all the branches of the existing banks, there is still a huge amount or the huge space which is still there which wherein the branches of a bank are not there because it is expected now as per the Nachiket Moore committee recommendations that any individual should have access to the banking facility 15 minutes from his residence. And if that has to be done, obviously there are some areas in India where bank branch, physical bank branch is not there and that's why the need to set up a small bank. And for these small banks, 70% 75% of their total business has to be, or the credit has to be targeted to a priority sector lending. Typically what we are doing with setting up of a small bank is we are ensuring that whatever space is now left with the expansion of the existing branch network of all the commercial banks, we would like to cover that and also if it is virtually not possible to open a branch in a hamlet where there are hardly 20 to 30 families where we cannot really set up a branch because enough business is not being garnered from that area, we have now decided we'll go through the BC model. BC model was there earlier also where every bank has its own BC network. Today now what is being said is when the small banks come in and with the technology, they will be ensuring that the cost of establishment of branch is leased. We will also now talk about setting up a BC who is a white label BC like a white label ATM. So white label BC will be sitting over there and irrespective of the technology solution which is being used by the various banks, be the existing commercial banks or the small banks which are coming in, there will be interoperability which will be there and he would be in a position to give service to any person who comes in irrespective of the fact where he is banking. As a result, if you see the initiatives that are happening, existing commercial banks which are there, new s small banks which are going to come and open branches in the areas where the branch penetration either is totally absent or needs to be improved further, payment banks where the entire payment and settlement happens seamlessly and ultimately it goes into the accounts which are being opened now under the Prime Minister Janadana Yojana 
and the various insurance schemes which are now coming for this particular entire part of the society. So, so much of money which is going to flow and so many dots are being created. So, probably we are going through a huge amount of evolution and at the end of one year we'll see that at the back end we will be in a position to connect the dots and with these all initiatives, if after one year we meet over here again, we will be discussing what we really did and what needs to be done to go on to a higher plane of growth. Thank you. Distinguished panelists and friends, good morning. I'm uh, from NABARD. As you know, NABARD started the earliest financial inclusion projects in the country, way back in 1988. 92, we introduced the concept of self-help groups. Uh, from 92, we have come a long way. Today we are talking about uh, the financial inclusion as a financial products or the insurance products, etc. When Nabad introduced this, it was a need-based product primarily for savings collection and internal lending. And then we linked with the banking sectors. So that is why even today it is called SSG Bank Linkage Program. It is not simply microfinance program. Because we strongly believe that the microfinance movement can be sustainable only with the formal financial institution coming into the fray. Otherwise, uh, the money lenders and other people will take their place and it will be counterproductive. So, uh, before I talk about anything, I will better, I don't talk, I will react to you later on. I will just give some, a few anecdotes and my own experiences to drive home the point any product services or anything that is not need based would be difficult to survive. You may want it but do you need it? Wants may vanish if there is no real need in the long time. So therefore I would focus some of the my anecdotes, my own personal experiences with you I was uh, heading Kerala Regional Office uh, years ago, just uh, the, the BCs were started and all those things. There was a letter from our own head office from Mumbai saying that uh, why there is no BCs in Kerala. We replied that every other building is a branch in Kerala, it's almost five times concentration and then we don't need BC to that and there's very high urbanization. One month later, we received a similar letter from Reserve Bank, why there is no BC. Then again from the government. And there is a lot of letters, a duo letters warning us that we are not having any BC. We were wondering what to do, even the SLBC we discussed, we don't have, we don't want BCs. We have enough of branches to serve Kerala state. Somewhere else, BCs may be required. Why is that every state should must have a BC? But because of the continued letters that were coming, a few BCs were opened. And then they were not having any turnover or anything. They also said that, sir, please relieve us, we don't want this. One day I travelled to Trishur. It's a very good hotel was there. When I was to make payment, I gave my card. He said, sorry, sir, we don't take card. It's, it's a Hastar hotel. It's, it's, a, it's a very big hotel and you should supposed to accept the card. They said, no, sir, we don't accept it. They said, there's an ATM in the hotel itself. He said, please take cash and pay us, please. So, similar, the other way around was also an experience in, a, in Delhi. They said, uh, we don't accept cash, please pay by card. I had been traveling through interior parts of UP. In a self-help group, women, we have been talking and then I asked about uh, the ration card. The lady said that, I have a ration card, 
but is but this is in the possession of the village headman there whenever i need a ration i go to him wait in front of his house hours together i take this card if he gives me then i go to the ration shop and the ration shop fellow will decide what to give me or not to give me irrespective of whether the stock is there etc and then i come back deposit the card back in this i visited a branch somewhere in a very well developed state one man in the branch who came the branch manager introduced him to me he said sir we he is uh, one of the biggest depositors he has 26 accounts in the branch and several borrowing accounts he manages well no default no where it manages well friends what i am saying is that we need to focus on the need of the people one more i forgot to tell you is about insurance i was telling one of the villagers to take insurance of 5 lakhs it's very easy we, we are giving it very concessional rates he said sir please his wife said that please don't take 5 lakh insurance there are people who can kill him is that true is it not true there's a huge risk of taking bigger insurance claim on a poor person there are instances where the people were killed for a smaller money 5 lakhs is a huge amount for him so there's a risk to his life friends when we do the financial inclusion we need to look at the empowerment the processes the needs just for the sake of doing it it would not be good there are different stakeholders there are insurance companies some of us governments individuals and the banks each one has something to offer but finally whether the people or the person who is being targeted does he need this if you are able to deliver products to satisfy his need affordable manner in a more convenient manner and in the timely manner then this products this project of financial inclusion will succeed otherwise we will end up pushing lots of products which may not be required and the end at the end we will try to blame the person himself rather than ourselves thank you uh good morning everybody and distinguished panelists thank you abizar for having me here so i would like to actually talk a little bit about the microfinance sector which is who i represent and uh, i mean there's been a lot of discussion here in today's uh, session about products and uh, passing on products to various um, uh, clients and what they would do with these products etc i think the primary fact of when we talk about financial inclusion is that there needs to be easy access uh if you uh, uh have a look at the maligam committee report what he says is the client base that the mfis are uh, focusing on don't look so much at reasonable access as at easy access because they just don't have the access in the first place so i think access is one of the primary criteria that we need to service when we looking at things like uh, primary uh, i mean like finan financial inclusion i th the advantage that the mfis possibly have is rather than the client coming to the uh, person giving them the credit the mfi goes to the client so the feet on street model that the mfi represents i think is a key factor that could help as far as financial inclusion is concerned because we already have that uh, infrastructure in place there are people out there connecting on a door to door basis 
And as we all know, nobody is going to walk, even if you have brick and mortar structures within five kilometers or three kilometers or two kilometers, unless it's absolutely essential. It's not because they don't want to go there. There is always apprehension around brick and mortar structures to the client base that we work with. Uh, uh, the growth statistics that I uh, would like to put here is in 2013 14, uh, the MFI sector, the NBFC MFI sector, uh, which represents about more than 90% of the MFI sector as a whole, reached out to about 2.8 crore, crore clients and we had a lending portfolio of 28,000 crores. This year we expect it to be about 36,000 crores and we're going reaching out to more than 3 crore plus clients. With those kind of statistics, when we talk about the Jandhan Yojana and opening bank accounts, you think it's a natural corollary that the MFI sector would be somebody who would translate these numbers into bank accounts. It doesn't happen because the bank accounts that you need to open, the small bank accounts, have provisions in place which are not beneficial to the MFI sector. When you say that you cannot transact more than 10,000 rupees, at one time, can't hold more than one lakh during a whole year and not more than 50,000 in your account at any point in time. For a microfinance client, it doesn't make sense because the loans that they take are 12,000, 15,000, 25,000 and they take it in single tranches. So having this kind of, uh, you know, transactional requirements as far as banking is concerned is actually uh, uh, not really beneficial to the sector. And considering we have three crore plus clients, it's a natural corollary that they should be feeding into the financial inclusion dialogue. Of course, we have taken this up with uh, the Reserve Bank and I have asked for modifications to these factors, I mean, as far as uh, micro-regulations are concerned. And we are very positive that it will uh, uh, work out in our favor. And we're hoping to hear from uh, them soon. I think the other thing that we need to also look at as far as the microfinance sector is concerned is uh, uh, the priority sector criteria. Now where banks have a certain uh, flexibility around PSL, the uh, MFI sector is limited to the net asset uh, value of about 50,000 rupees. And the on lending uh, that banks do to MFIs, we do not get the benefit of that on lending because of the restriction of 50,000 rupees because that is your net uh, asset uh, as far as uh, your lending uh, portfolio is concerned. So I think the, we need to look at different models and somebody was talking about databases. We have a large database because all the clients are onboarded to credit bureaus. So the credit history of these three core clients is already there on credit bureaus and yes, now the bank, the Reserve Bank has said that other players such as SHGs, banks, etc. should also onboard data onto credit bureaus because then it gives you a far greater credit profile and particularly when you're lending to vulnerable populations, actually looks at the factor of uh, indebtedness. Whereas until now it was something as limited as two, not more than two MFIs can lend to a person uh, with a certain level of income but other players had no such restrictions. So the man could possibly have two microfinance loans, but he could have NBFC loans, he could have bank loans. So the actual criteria of indebtedness and over indebtedness was not being addressed, which is now being addressed. Uh, somebody was talking about databases. The, I think the only way databases would work if there was a convergence of various models of various databases that different agencies, whether it be insurance, whether it be banking, whether it be credit bureaus, if at some point somebody can arrive at a convergence model for these credit, I mean for these databases, and UID currently doesn't cover the whole country. 70 crore UID uh, 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 accounts have been opened, but there are 30 plus crores that are still out of the UID net, and, and especially in areas like the Northeast, etc., there's very negligible penetration. So yes, UID is a very important fact, and in fact, I think uh, NBFC MFIs may even think of being enrollers at some point if they think it's beneficial in terms of clients. But the thing is, if it's not, and in fact, uh, the, I think the Supreme Court has recently said that UID cannot be made a mandatory KYC, although lots of banks are saying that it should be, for the simple reason that penetration is not complete. So you have to take factors into account, including databases, convergent models, and which is the best carrier as far as, as your last mile delivery is concerned as far as the products, whichever products, they may, whether they are insurance, whether they are uh, credit, 
uh, and uh, this should be something that needs to be looked at. Uh, regarding training, etc., now the clients that we talk about have very little awareness of technology, have very little access, and the training that needs to be imparted, I think, has to be done over a sustained period rather than two days, three days training, because it's about change in behavior, change in understanding, and change in accepting what is being rolled out there, number one. Number two, even the Nachiket Moore uh, committee talks about uh, vendors having to tell clients about what products are beneficial to the client. And that, I think, requires a level of awareness and literacy that probably at the moment we are really not touching on. So as far as the microfinance uh, segment is concerned, we are going through a, cha a change ourselves. There's Bandhan, which is becoming a universal bank. There are large players going into be uh, small finance banks. So we need to look at our sector today and see where all these developments are finally going to lead us and whether we're going to look at, it, at them as sectors or are we still going to focus on the vulnerable population that all these new entities will be dealing with. Thank you. Uh, just that I, I liked, I just picked up a last comment which said that uh, large MFIs are going to become small banks. <laughs> Good analogy to talk about actually, large and small. But frankly, it's small bank does not really mean small bank, it just means small loan. They can be as large as they can be. Uh, frankly, we spoke about, uh, all the panelists spoke about their respective areas of what we can do. What we see is that there is a whole lot of regulation that's come in, uh, shows the intent of the government shows the fact that the government really wants to do something on financial inclusion. But on the other hand, if I see, uh, there are institutions like Labard since 1988 who have been doing financial uh, inclusion. There is obviously history. There are obviously problems. And now we are going to have a new set of the whole public, uh, private sector coming in, effectively, uh, which is also going to be into financial services. So to some stage, you know, one has to figure out where do the dots actually join. How do we make sure that there is a, a concerted effort? And now I have questions on, on each individual person, but I just need to th start off with a theme. Uh, you know, what we have done as part of all the regulations that have come out in the last two years, uh, whether, entail, whether with intent or without intent, is actually we have created some kind of segmentation within the banking industry. The whole financial services business has got segmented. And when you talk segmented, what it means is there are people who have defined roles and should be doing defined things. So, for example, there is a large bank which is basically has a strong financial position, has the trust of the people, has the ability to collect deposits. That bank is obligated, and rightly so, to contribute 40% of their lending into a priority sector pool. Fantastic. Are they now, given that we go have our infrastructure in place, we already have a public sector infrastructure in place, but now we'll have a private sector infrastructure in place. Are we going to be in a position to figure out that the right people do the last mile lending? And the last people may, the, the right people who do the last mile lending may also be incentivized to create a more sustainable model out of it because that's the model they have. So a payments bank will try and make sure that they cross-sell insurance, cross-sell mutual funds, make sure that they use efficient technology to make sure they make money. But for a bank, a large bank, for which maybe a payments function is a little bit of a non-core function, would not put so much time and effort in building that efficiency that is required in that system. So what really happens is that there requires to be a segmentation in this business. Now, an analogy I have is that, you know, Hindustan Lever manufactures soap. They are not required to sell 40% of the soap directly to the ultimate consumer. If that were to be the requirement, I don't know how they would even meet it. Clearly what they have is that we will sell it to a CNF agent, CNF agent will sell it to a wholesaler, the wholesaler will sell it to a Kirana shop and the Kirana shop will sell it to the customer. That is the ecosystem that we have. I am wondering, and maybe at point of debate, is that an ecosystem that financial services can have? That yes, there is a pool of, ca of uh, private sector lending and, and Mudra is one example, Mudra Bank actually talks about that. Can they actually capture some of that pool, not have any direct or directed lending, to the wholesaler who actually gets the deposit, but make sure that that is channelized through a channel 
into people who ultimately are motivated to do that micro lending. Now, whether that is a small bank, whether there is a, a, a microfinance institution, whether it is NABAD or anybody else, can, or, or maybe sometimes even the, the bank itself who already set up the infrastructure. Can we have an ecosystem which is set up which can deal with that? So really, I wanted to open that bit uh, in a debate. Uh, we have around 10-15 uh, minutes. I'd like to just quickly open a question. Mr. Roy, what's the experience that you have on micro-insurance? Uh, uh, and LIC frankly is a lead in that. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, uh, be before I answer this question on micro-insurance, I just want to make one point uh, that financial inclusion is a very popular topic and everybody wants to be involved in it. And uh, I think there will be more than one institution which would like to be the first. With it, yeah. The first. Yeah. And uh, we were told that NAVAD was the first to get involved in financial inclusion in 1988. If my memory serves me right, in 1987, Government of India launched its first social security scheme, which was administered by LIC. So, I mean, this is just, uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, just goes to prove that how, how popular this topic is. Uh, coming to the question about micro-insurance, uh, there have been, uh, we have done extremely well as far as coverage is concerned. But the points I was making uh, was largely drawn from our experience in managing the micro-insurance portfolio, where we, we, we are facing concerns as far as distribution is, is con uh, issue is there. On the technology platform, we are facing concerns, and uh, the pricing is is a serious issue. And I was trying to make this point that we need to, I mean, our, our intention is that an ideal product goes to the end consumer. Now, how do we get it across to him? That is the second question. The first question is that what are the components of an so-called ideal product? Without going into the details, one thing very important is that the ideal, so-called ideal product will have to be very, very competitively priced. And when we competitively price a product of a, of a nature like life insurance, then we are entering into areas that there could be uh, haircuts on various other parameters. So we have to be very clear that what is that one or two or three most important things that we want to deliver to the end beneficiary. On that, there will be no compromise, whatever may be the price implications. So, we have had challenges on designing products. We have had ch challenges on pricing of those products. We have had challenges on, I mean, we still have challenges on distribution of those products. And technology is still a major challenge. And... Uh, these are works in progress. I am sure that the IRDAI's regulations on micro-insurance uh, are in the public domain. So, in the sense, we know what, uh, where IRDAI wants to take this uh, line of business to. But then these are the four broad challenges that we have faced as far as micro-insurance is concerned. I mean, also the, the bigger challenge is that does the consumer, the ultimate farmer, does it view it as an expense or does it view it as a protection? And then that also has a big role to play because, you know, for him, does he feed his family or does he take insurance? I guess the answer is quite ob obvious. So, there is also that education process in terms of making sure that he understands that he is away from vulnerability when he does some kind of crop insurance. But just, uh, uh, Mr. Nageshwar Rao, coming to you, uh, the problems that have been highlighted around, uh, you know, the distribution, the reach, the technology, do you see payments banks addressing some of that or all of that? Because your payment, your business <coughs> model, I presume, uh, given that you don't have a lending or a spread business, is primarily will depend more in terms of how you are able to provide the services along with uh, a, a remittance kind of business. So how do you see overcoming some of these challenges? You see, in terms of distribution, one of the uh, you know, so topics that is often discussed is uh, providing uh, physical access, you know, so whether through a branch, uh, you know, which is the reason why, because so there is a mandate on banks on how many branches need to be opened in rural areas and so on. Uh, or in respect of uh, having, let's say, a business correspondent kind of an outlet, because so which provides access. Uh, our belief is, because so that it is not necessary uh, to rely only on physical infrastructure to be able to provide access. And uh, I think uh, today, technology can bridge, uh, you know, so that access and provide that access. Because, uh, uh, you know, so even if you provide a physical access and so even have criteria like so how many kilometers, 
uh, you know, so you would like to see an access point and so on. Okay, but uh, it can never beat uh, something that is there in your pocket. How do you think it will change now? Uh, you know, this, this is an obvious problem, people knew it. Now with the advent of a payments bank or, or, or a small bank or any other, how do you think that will change? I mean, so I think, I think would you look at it differently? With, uh, with uh, specialist uh, institutions giving focus to the uh, payments area, so, and uh, uh, making mobile-based payments uh, possible, uh, you know, so uh, that is when I think, so you will start to see, uh, you know, so a change and a revolution, transformation. Uh, you know, so with the falling prices of smartphones, so with rising aspirations of people, uh, more and more uh, people are actually, uh, you know, so having uh, smartphones in their hands. So you look at the kind of uh, fancy phones, so people carry around. Uh, you know, so and and that actually opens the possibility for, uh, you know, so delivering these services uh, through. A, a, a device, and of course, I think that can make a change. Because so, you know, both in providing access and doing it uh, uh, at, uh, in, in a cost-effective manner. Because so the other other thing that very often, of course, gets discussed is, of course, whether uh, and also people can really adapt to this new technology. I think we are underestimating the uh, you know so uh, you know so the uh, people's capability to adapt to that technology. So that uh, you know, so look at as to how you know ATMs uh, you know uh, today. Uh, are being used by everybody because I remember uh, the days because uh, when uh, uh, my father in his old age because uh, had you know, so had very discomfort in terms of using an ATM because of that but you know he could figure it you know he figured it out because uh, you know very quickly uh, and, and look at how because uh, people use uh, uh, you know so mobile phones today because uh, everywhere uh, you know so and I think we are underestimating people's uh, you know so capability to use technology because and that can actually uh, make a significant change in the way distribution develops in our country, so both providing access as well as in terms of cost of, you know, managing the cost of distribution. I'll just open one question to the whole panel, uh, given the paucity of time, because I need to also open it up to the audience. So we have this new Mudra Bank uh, concept that has been uh, talked about in this budget. Uh, and uh, we have somebody from Nabad uh, who's already done some kind of refinancing on, and, then, and we have the ultimate consumer, which is the MFIN guys. What I'd like to know is what is what is your point of view around Mudra uh, uh, acting as a regulator as well as a financier, you know, for, uh, from your point of view, Ratna, and then maybe we can move on to Mr. Amal to figure out uh, what the respective point view are. And of course, I'd appreciate Ms. Pinsey also if she can uh, contribute to that. So, uh, thanks, Professor. So, basically, as far as Mudra is concerned, I mean, just plain governance parameters, irrespective of this sector. I'm being sector agnostic here. Uh, having a service provider be a regulator, in my opinion, con uh, you know, uh, adds up to conflict of interest and this is purely from a theoretical perspective, so it's not specific to Mudra as such. And in fact, I think around 2012 or 13, there was some talk of mm. NABAD regulating the MFI sector and one of the things that it didn't take off as a regulator for the mm. MFI sector was precisely the same point which was raised by Mr. Maligam at that point in time. Mm. So I don't know how that has in any uh, way changed today. Having said that, as far as the specific MFI sector is concerned, now it's gone through a lot of upheavals. It's seen a lot of, uh, 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 you know, things that have happened in 2010 that have completely put the sector back and it's slowly recovering and is doing well now and is growing. So the sectoral sentiment is that at this juncture, moving regulation to any other entity and it's not mudra specifically but to any other entity may actually because there's a lot of investor confidence there's a lot of stability that is slowly coming in they feel that maybe bringing in a new player into the conversation at this juncture may affect that stability in a certain way and hence wouldn't really be looking forward to it. and this is something we are in fact engaged MFIN is engaged with the core group of the mudra bank and is uh, placing industry sentiment there, so that when the final micro, I mean the regulation around the Mudra Bank comes in, I think this would also process, uh, I don't know where it's going in terms of yes or no, but yes, it's a point of view that's being placed there. And I think the other thing happens is if you have a uh, multiplicity of regulators, there is always a case of regulatory arbitrage that would come out and would affect all players. And that's a natural corollary. So having one regulator and other supervisory agencies and the levels of delegation would then depend on who you perceive as what is possibly a roadmap that we could think of. Having said that, it's not a comment on Budra Bank, per se.
there is a RBI which is regulating the overall business of the bank. But when they go to the debt market, there is a fee which is regulating and then different products are regulated by the different people. If they go to the insurance, then they say, data is regulating. And there is nobody making noise, big noise about that. So therefore, when you are delivering a service as and there is a regulatory uh, framework for that particular service, then we have to uh, abide by uh, that kind of a regulation. I don't think there is a serious issue. Similarly, when uh, the the institutions uh, which are uh, uh, what I call uh, uh, the, the registration based on the incorporation, the cooperatives and, uh, and the trusts, etc., they have their own uh, they have their own uh, kind of uh, regulatory framework. In a particular uh, uh, what do you call the uh, the narrow sense. So, if we look at the financial market, the banks are regulated by the RBI primarily on one ground that it is. Uh, protecting the depositors' interest. That is, the, the entire Banking Regulation Act revolves around the protecting the depositors' interest. If you look at the cooperatives, which are primarily the lenders which are regulating, from the lenders' perspective it is regulated because the institution is created as such. But when the regulation, banking regulation was applied to cooperatives, there were some problems. So even now that is persist because one set of regulation comes in the perspective of the lender, I mean borrowers, the other uh, is uh, from the uh, depositors' perspective. So there is always a conflict which will supersede what? So there you see we are talking about the dual control about cooperatives. And then when it comes to the MFIs, again, there is, we see, are we talking about the supplier's perspective? We, we are talking about the, the investors' uh, protection, etc., etc., or are we talking about the borrowers? which are also need to be protected in some ways. So there are always uh, conflicting this one. So there are three major pillars that we need to consider. One is the, the regulators. The, the second is the, uh, the governance system that is putting in place in the, in, the, in the respective institutions. And the third is the supervisory. Even if there is a regulation and if there is a, a, a governance, how far we are from the enforcing the regulations. Even today in the banks, there are many things which are very difficult to enforce. Even though there are regulation, regulatory violences, uh, violations, uh, so uh, it's very difficult to enforce certain things. So enforcement is also very important when you are talking about regulation. Sure. Otherwise, it will all be on paper. For example, private sector, if uh, the how, how difficult it is to enforce. We can penalize, RBI is penalizing some way or the other, but still it is not able to completely enforce that the, uh, the people are abiding by this. So we need to consider all these things. Multiple regulation is not an issue. And who is regulating from which perspective? If a good governance system is there, I think they will be more comfortable with any type of regulation becomes um, um, implemented because uh, they are uh, very focused about the philosophy of microfinance. If you are doing it, no worry about 75% uh, uh, priority sector, no worry about anybody regulating because you are doing the right thing. Thank you. Uh, in the interest of time, I'd just like to open up to the audience, ma'am. Uh, yeah. Some mic. Thanks. I'm Royston from Grameen Capital. It's pretty serendipitous that the topic today of financial inclusion comes on a day where we are announcing Ratan Tata's investment in Grameen Capital. And uh, as you mentioned, thanks, Abhise. As you mentioned at the upfront, how do you get sustainable capital coming in? And I think really the key uh, is to be able to find a mechanism to connect the dots. Uh, we are talking about a need for investing initially with muted returns. And so we have a 2% CSR bucket somewhere coming under MCA. We are talking about the social venture capital fund coming under SEBI. We are talking about priority sector lending coming under RBI. And so how does one really put all these pieces of the ecosystem in play uh, in a more cogent manner? Who is the one championing this to the government or the powers that be saying, if we put all these pieces together, we then have a real winning solution. But because they are sitting in different pockets and silos, it's suboptimal all the way. How do we create first the initial thrust uh, through CSR money to be able to do the financial literacy, to be able to build the networks to reach the last mile and then overlay that as and when debt and equity are required. Uh, and I would like to ask anyone on the panel saying, who is taking that onus uh, to pull all these pieces together? The 
Well, initially, it would look that too many players are there. As I said in my opening remarks also, that a uh, lot of dots have been created. But uh, if you see, uh, before the Prime Minister Janadhani Yojana also, a huge amount of infrastructure has been created as far as financial inclusion is concerned. With this, now what we have started is we have started with the end user or the end beneficiary and now what we are doing is with the initiation of small banks, with the initiation of payment banks, with the initiation of mudra bank, wherever we felt that there were some gaps, we are trying to you know, correct these gaps and uh, probably one year down the line or two years down the line with all the players into it, uh, small banks as far as their business is concerned with the priority sector lending, the existing commercial banks continuing with their priority sector lending and their financial inclusion initiatives, the payment banks uh, bridging the gap of money get being flown from the origination to the ultimate beneficiary and the mudra bank not only regulating but also providing finance to the very important players that is MFIs who presently have the only source of income which is there is financial funding from the commercial banks. So all these taken together, all in all, if we see three years or four years down the line, we will see that we would have connected all the dots. So when all these initiatives right now which are being looked into, uh, we feel that a lot of initiatives have happened very haphazardly, but uh, uh, through the chaos we will see an order which is going to emerge. As far as CSR initiatives is concerned, uh, most of the players are just allocating money for the you know, fulfillment purpose. I feel those players who really go into it with real seriousness would be playing their part in providing funding and also initiating the process at the ground level so that all this together really moves to the direction in which we all are working. That is, all the BPL families getting all the funding, creating the skill set, generating employment and ensuring that uh, the money gets distributed in all the startup society. Yeah, I'm Prabhat from Indusind Bank. Uh, my question is to Mr. Rao. Uh, sir, are we barking the wrong tree by asking highly regulated, cost-heavy and brick and mortar banking industry to lead the financial inclusion? And as uh, the channel pair, uh, panel chair sorry, uh, rightly pointed out that uh, FMCG and telecom, in my view, is the right combination to lead this financial inclusion through this payment bank mechanism. The, connecting the dots that we are talking, is uh, telecom companies already are there, uh, almost 100% there, and if your mobile number can be your account number, uh, most of these are prepaid numbers, even postpaid comes with wallet. If you are uh, uh, allowed to in be interoperable among uh, Airtel, Vodafone, all these uh, service providers, your uh, account recharge can give you savings, withdrawal, and transfers. Your prepaid uh, recharge can be transferred to your friend. So you can transfer money, you can deposit money, bring it in your wallet, and you can uh, do cash in, cash out at these uh, prepaid recharge stores. The other thing that rightly was pointed out was the FMCG. All these pan shops, kirana shops are already there. Rather than we reaching with brick and mortar structure, cost heavy structures there, can't we utilize this uh, infrastructure? So you have telecom companies and uh, FMCG companies or the kirana stores already there. They can give you the uh, savings, withdrawal, deposit, transfer, these basic services. Now for insurance or assets or uh, investments, wherever the uh, organizations, banks, insurance companies see opportunities, they are already there. Wherever they don't see an opportunity, if these uh, uh, telecom companies or FMC FMCG companies can aggregate demand, like a bank bazaar or uh, their equivalent, if they can pool that demand and pass it on to competing banks, they will surely uh, cater to those needs. Isn't that a work workable model? I think so. What, uh, uh, what you're saying as uh, the alternate access model, so I think all already exist today and, and uh, are allowed to be used by banks uh, you know, and other lenders as well. Okay, so that uh, whether you would like to use uh, Kirana stores okay, so or, you know, so or uh, you know, uh, other shops like that, okay, so as a business correspondent, okay, so that's today possible. Uh, you know, so you want to reach your customer uh, through a, a technology device like a mobile, that is possible. Okay, so, uh, you know, and, and I think it's really up to each uh, uh, institution to draw up its own strategy on okay, so how it would like to uh, meet its own business objectives and of course, uh, you know, so uh, any regulatory mandates that may be there. 
Okay. It's just the last question, maybe because we're still running out of time. Yeah, it's on, it's on. No. Uh, hi, Sachin from HSPC. Uh, just a quick question on, you know, the jam trinity uh, and the last part of that being mobile. Now, when we go to the village or down to the tier 5 or tier 6 towns or villages, uh, is there 3G connectivity uh, which is good to enable this kind of a, a trinity to exist? Or are we looking at an SMS-based mobile banking model or a USSD-based model? What's the, the thinking out there? app on a smartphone, uh, you know, so that will uh, require a smartphone, okay, so, and, and having said that, of course, so that uh, the, uh, you know, availability and affordability of uh, smartphones is increasing day by day, so therefore, okay, so you could expect to see uh, more and more smartphones in uh, people's hands. And if someone is using a uh, feature phone, I think uh, the viable technology there is UDDI, and of course, uh, uh, you know, so Try has done a wonderful thing in terms of actually imposing a ceiling on the amount of charges that, uh, you know, a UDA, UDDI uh, usage, uh, you know, so should be charged at by any telecom operator. Therefore, so that makes it very affordable as well. So I think these are two uh, viable methods uh, uh, for uh, mobile phones. Okay, so, uh, and, and uh, you know, as far as connectivity is concerned, okay, so if you can, uh, you know, if you have uh, airwaves uh, to uh, do a voice call, okay, so you have airwaves to do all this stuff. Just in the interest of time, I'd just like to quickly conclude. I think it was a very uh, uh, useful session in terms of getting perspectives from across the financial services platform. Uh, frankly, regulation has put in place uh, in the required infrastructure to actually create the demand. Uh, we are going to have multiple agencies doing uh, a lot of financial inclusion. The government's thrust and direction in terms of making it happen, I think, is clearly visible. And that will drive a lot of players to do what they have to do. I think what is more, what is required now is innovative business models, breakthrough technologies which are going to come in. And frankly, one of the things that the government needs to do, given that this is more of a, a, a regulatory panel kind of post reform, is how do we uh, join all these dots? We have, we have far too many agencies. We have each agency which wants to do rules. Which we, 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 on, we have one agency which is already doing what somebody else wants to do. How do we make sure we dot all these, uh, uh, join all these dots? to make sure that we get this into a smooth running process. I think that is where regulation will need to focus on, that's where regulators will need to focus on. And frankly, you know, while we have this BPL as a line to define that, you know, we need to help these people alleviate above the poverty line, I think there is also another line uh, which has to be the literacy line. And somewhere, unless we cross that, the ability to cross sell through the FMCG sector or the mobile sector will be limited because the person selling itself has to be educated rather than the person buying the product. So frankly, literacy has to be two-way. We need to develop that a long way through. People need to understand very basic stuff in terms of uh, uh, what uh, other financial products do to them. And once that literacy is, is, uh, is uh, inculcated, uh, I think there will be a lot more buying in of the services that we're talking about. So financial inclusion, as, uh, as Mr. Amal said some time back, is not about trying to sell what you want to sell. It is you have to sell what people want to buy. And a lot of what people want to buy will come through literacy. So with that, frankly, literacy and joining the dots are the two uh, takeaways we'd like to leave out of this panel and like to thank all the panel members and thank ET for doing what they did. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I request our panel members to kindly remain on the stage and come together for a group photograph. May I also uh, invite uh, Ms. Sandhya to please come on stage to present the mementos to our panel members. Firstly, to Ms. Subha Lakshmi Panse, former Chairman and Managing Director, Allahabad Bank. To the Managing Director and CEO of NSDL, Mr. G.V. Nageshwar Rao. To Mr. S.K. Roy, Chairman, LIC of India. To Mr. R. Amalor Pavanathan, who is the Deputy Managing Director of NABAD. To Ms. Ratna Vishwanathan, Deputy CEO and Compliance Officer, MFIN. And our panel chair, Mr. Abhizar Divanji, who is a partner and national leader of financial services, ENY India.
Thank you once again. And I request all our panel members to just one more time come together for a group photograph.